Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming here. Uh, my name is Marco Ranaldi. I'm an assistant uh, professor here at UCL, and uh, most happy to welcome you to the launch of Political Cleavages and Social Inequality. This is the French book, uh, but the, uh, the, the English one will come out on December the 14th, so we're anticipating this a little more. Um, so what is this book? about. Uh, this basically is a book which is in between political science and economics. And, uh, and this is a book that is edited by uh, Amory Guetton uh, from the Paris School of Economics, uh, by Clara Martinez Toledano, who is here with us, and uh, by Thomas Piketty. And uh, this is published by Harvard University Press. Um, what is this book about? This is about uh, studying the links between uh, voters' political preferences on the one hand and uh, their socioeconomic characteristics like income, gender, education. Uh, and this is done both in the developing and in the developed world. They cover 50 democracies and this spans for more than seven uh, decades. So actually what comes along with this book is a massive uh, empirical project and an amazing database that will for sure inspire uh, future work on the matter. Uh, of course, this is uh, the result of the collaboration with many scholars working on, on this matter. And uh, in particular, there are 20, and each of them has focused on specific countries or region of the world. And today, we are super lucky not only to have one presenter or two, we actually have four. So this is the amazing things of being here in London. Uh, and I'm actually going to introduce you the four speakers of today's talk. So uh, the first is Clara Martinez Soledano. She is uh, an assistant professor of financial economics at Imperial Business School, but she's also wealth distribution coordinator at the World Inequality Lab at the Paris School of Economics. And uh, she was my former PhD colleague, so we're a good friend. Um, the second uh, contributor is uh, Julia Turas, uh, who is a PhD student in social policy at the London School of Economics, and she will uh, introduce her joint chapter co-ordered with other scholars on uh, Algeria, uh, Iraq, and Turkey. She's part, actually, of your previous master thesis at the Paris School of Economics, yeah. right? Uh, third speaker is going to be Thomas Zawisa. I hope I'm pronouncing it uh, correct. Good enough. Good, good <laughs> enough. Good enough. Good enough. Good enough. And he's a research fellow at uh, the Department of Economics at UCL and is going to introduce his chapter quarter um, on uh, Czech Republic, Hungary, and Poland. And I can actually, I can't imagine a better place where to present this chapter than uh, the School of Slavonia and East European Studies, where we are. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Jonathan Berman, who is a lecturer in economics and policy at King's College. London in the uh, political economy department, and it was talk about uh, Israel. Uh, so the structure of this talk is going to be uh, the speakers will talk for one hour and a half, and then we will leave the floor to the Q&A session. Um, everything here will be recorded, so for those online, uh, uh, there will be also the possibility to access uh, the link in the coming days, which will be uh, uh, provided in the UCL page. And before starting this, I briefly want to mention that this event has been organized by the Center for Comparative uh, uh, Studies uh, of Emerging Economies at UCL. And I wish to particularly thank Nauro Campos, who's the director of the Center, as well as uh, Elias uh, uh, Kodrajanis and uh, Patricia Gabalova, who are helping enormously to make this happen. Without further ado, Clara, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for attending this event and also to the organizers, Marco and the UCL Center, School of Slavonic uh, and East, uh, European Studies, for inviting us to present our new book, Political Cleavages and Social Inequalities, A Study of 50 Democracies. This is, as uh, Marco has already said, is co-edited by Amory Guetton, Thomas Piketty and myself. And let me first uh, give you the motivation behind the writing of this book. It has already been documented that economic inequalities have significantly increased in the last four decades, although at different speeds in the different regions of the world. However, these increasing disparities do not seem to have come together with new class cleavages. On the contrary, recent decades have been marked by the emergence of new identity cleavages, which are embodied, for instance, by the rise of Trump in the US, Le Pen in France, Bolsonaro in Brazil, or Brexit in the UK. The question is then, how can we explain this phenomenon? And this is precisely the goal of this book, 
to shed new light about this question by making progress along two different dimensions. On the one side, the geographical dimension, as we analyze the structure of the vote in 50 electoral democracies, and on the other side, a temporal dimension, as we cover the longest possible time frame to study the long-term dynamics of political conflict. And Marco has already mentioned that, but let me emphasize that the completion of this book would not have been possible with the collaboration and the effort of, more, of 20 researchers across different parts of the world that have focused on the different, uh, the different chapters. And I'm very happy to be today in the good company of some of these contributors, Juliette Kurash, Tom Sadisha, Jonathan Berman, and Attila Bure. Today, I will give a general presentation of the book. I will then present the most important findings taking a comparative perspective, so cross-country perspective. I will then introduce you very briefly to the database that we have built to make all the resources available, the project available for, for the uh, researchers and the public sphere. And I will uh, conclude with some remarks. So this is the book. Unfortunately, the English version is not yet available. There were some delays, but I have here the French version. So for those that speak French, they can really get it. If not, we have to wait un until, until December. And let me give you a short uh, summary of the philosophy of this project, because I think the idea is not only to have a book, the idea is to have to, was to create a project that will continue and that will keep attracting more and more researchers interested in this question. So the whole point is to present in this project comparative results about the structure of political activities. And in particular, we are interested in asking the following question. How does the vote for specific parties or coalitions vary across time and space according to different socioeconomic characteristics? And in particular, we focus on income, education, religion, age, gender, location, et cetera. And the main contribution is that we have created and exploit a new database about the structure of the vote uh, on, based on electoral surveys that cover more than 500 elections and cover the period between 1948, the post-war second war period, until 2020. The book is structured in case studies about the different countries and regions, and it is preceded by a comparative chapter, which is going to be the chapter I'm going to be focusing on. Later on, the rest of contributors will present the different case studies. And let me emphasize before showing the results that our objective is mainly descriptive. We want to document for each country which are the coalitions that exist, who are the voters that support them, and which cleavages are politically represented or not. And you will see that there are substantial variations depending on the regions and the, and the periods that we, that we look at. So this is the structure of the book. The first chapter is the comparative chapter. We then have some chapters on continental Europe and the US, Northern Europe, Australia, Canada, and New Zealand, Southern Europe, some other continental European countries, Belgium, Switzerland, Netherlands, and Austria, the Central Eastern Europe chapter that we are gonna to focus today. We then move to Asia. We have chapters on India, Pakistan, Japan, Thailand, Philippines, Malaysia, and Indonesia, South Korea, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. We also have a chapter, uh, when we move to Latin America, we have Brazil, Argentina, Chile, Costa Rica, Colombia, Mexico, and Peru. When we move to Africa, we have South Africa, Botswana, Ghana, Nigeria, and Senegal. And we will also focus today on Israel and Turkey, Iraq, and Algeria, which are the last two chapters of, of the book. So you can see that we try to, to cover as many countries as possible. And the choice of countries was mainly based on data availability. OK, so let me now move to the presentation of the results. As, as you, I have already shown you, I will start talking about the different cleavages that we have identified. I will not have time to go in detail, but if you have questions later on, we can expand more in the discussion. So one of the main contributions of the book is that we aim to describe in a systematic manner how the vote varies according to income and education which are two distinct measures, but complementary to social class. And we, the idea is to really focus on them across time and also across space. And when we look at, at, at these two uh, variables, uh, what we find in the Western world is that there has been a gradual process of disconnection between the effects on income and education on the vote. So to document this fact, what we do is we use a very simple indicator, which is simply the difference between the, the share of 
top 10% educated individuals in each country, voting for social democratic parties and affiliated parties, and the, and the uh, bottom 90% educated voters. So we compare the difference in the vote between these two groups of the population, and we do that for education and for income. So the red line shows this difference of this indicator in the, for the education, and the blue line shows this indicator for the case of income. And this graph shows the average evolution, the five-year average evolution between 1960s up to 2020. Again, I'm focusing here on the Western world for the 12 countries for which we have information for the whole period. And let me also emphasize that these uh, indicators are after controlling for all the other socioeconomic characteristics that we have in the database, age, gender, uh, location, religion, etc. So what you can see in this graph is that in the 1960s, it was like the least educated individuals disproportionately voted more for left-wing parties. However, this difference that was 15 percentage points has gradually disappeared, turning zero in, a, in a, around the 1990s, but it became positive and even more positive when we arrived to uh, the last five years, the period between 2015 and 2020. So you can clearly see a reversal of the education divide. While in the 60s, low educated individuals disproportionately voted more for left-wing parties, nowadays, high educated individuals are the ones disproportionately voting more for, for the left. What the interesting fact is that if we look at income, we don't see the same reversal. So high income individuals disproportionately continue to vote more for uh, right wing parties relative to uh, bottom income uh, individuals. And this is what we call the emergence of multi elite party systems, because we have, we, we have moved from a class based system where low income and low educated uh, voters used to vote uh, more for left-wing left parties to a world where the high educated elite votes differently than the economic elite. And we want to also uh, compare this system to the Indian system, uppercase system, where we have the Brahmins, who are the priest intellectuals that support the left, and uh, the merchants who are like the businessmen, the, the economic elite that supports the right. And that's why we see, like we compare them because we see again in the Western world context, these two elite uh, party systems. So this is one of the main findings of, of the paper, but what is important also to mention is that this emergence of multi-elite party system has come together with a very big reshuffling of the political spectrum. So here you look at the, you can see the composition of the vote in Western uh, democracies between 1945 up to 2020. And what you can see is that there has been a steady decline in the vote share to social democratic, socialist, and other left parties, and also to conservative and Christian Democrats. When you look at communists, you see that they, they used to have 7% of the vote share in 1945, and they have um, barely or almost completely disappeared. On the contrary, what we see that there has been an emergence of anti-immigration and green parties that uh, were born in the 70s and 80s and have uh, gradually or steadily um, get a higher vote share. And when you look at liberals, you see that uh, their vote share has been very, sta very stable, approximately around 10%, but this, there are important variations across countries. Here we are simply depicting the average for the Western countries that we study. And this big transformation of the political spectrum with the emergence of anti-migration and green parties, we argue that has also exacerbated this emergence of multi-elite party systems. And let me explain you why. So if you look at this quadrant that plots the relative support on the x-axis among high educated voters with the same indicator that I explained before, and the relative support among top income voters on the y-axis, what you see is what I said before, that's the class-based system. Low income and low educated voters used to disproportionately vote more for left-wing parties. High income, high educated voters used to disproportionately vote more for right-wing uh, parties. However, if we now move to the recent period, the period between 2000 and 2020, we see that income, where you see the, the light blue and red dots, income continues to divide these two groups 
However, there has been a change in education. You see here the reversal. Like you see that the upper uh, left quadrant, we have now uh, the high income low educated and on the uh, red, uh, right, um, right, right, uh, right quadrant, bottom quadrant, you have the, um, the, le the level parties. And what is very interesting to see is that green and anti-migration parties are divided by education, but not by income groups, okay? And that's why there has been an exacerbation of this multi elite party systems because green parties are disproportionately supported more by the high educated and anti-migration by the uh, low educated. If we now move completely to a different world, to the non-Western world, we see that we can no longer make these claims and the situation and the explanation is much more complex. So this figure shows the same difference, but now instead of comparing uh, top 10 versus bottom 90, we are comparing bottom, nine, bottom 50 to uh, top 50 for income on the X axis and uh, education on the Y axis. And what you see here is that contrary to the reversal of the education cleavage that we document for the Western world, there is a clear correlation, positive correlation between income and education. So this suggests that in the non-Western non countries, the standard, the usual traditional class cleavages seem to be still more pre uh, predominant than, than in uh, the Western world. But in, the, in the book, we give many explanations and we also explain this if different case studies. I don't have time to go into the details today, but if you're interested, you can, you can look at the comparative chapter and the different case studies. So let me now move to uh, the religion cleavages. So we, religion cleavages have already been extensively studied, uh, but what we do uh, in this book is to document them with our very large database and a longer times perspective. And what we show is that historically, they have been very marked in Western democracies and they remain strong, but they have weakened uh, in, recent, in recent years. And we also document that the same similar cleavages that we, uh, I will show you for the Western world also are prevalent in non-Western democracies. And in particular, what we observe is that there are certain coalitions that attract the religious minorities and the non-religious compared to the uh, other coalitions that attract the religious majority. So let me show you the graphs. So this first graph applies to the Western world, in particular to the English speaking and Northern European countries. And what we are depicting here is the difference between the share of Protestants voting for um, left-wing parties and the rest of voters, okay? And what you can see is that Protestants, which is the religious majority in these uh, countries, have remained significantly less likely to vote for these parties throughout the whole period. This, uh, this difference has become uh, less pronounced in the recent years, but we still see that, that, that the division is there. If we now move to Catholic and Miss Protestant Catholic countries, we see the same type of uh, divergence. Uh, Catholic uh, voters tend uh, to vote significantly less to left-wing parties, but you see that in the 50s, this division was more salient. So in Catholic countries, apparently, uh, the religious divisions were stronger, but this division has also weakened. We still have an important division today, but much weaker than we had what we had in the 50s. If we now move to the non-Western world, we see also important religious divisions, and this is probably, probably the most novel of the findings because it, it was much harder to collect all the data on the non-Western than the Western world. And in particular here, I'm showing you the religious secular cleavage in Latin American countries, all the Latin American countries that we cover in the book. And what is very striking to see is that in all of these countries, there is a, re, a religious secular cleavage. By, what do I mean by that? Non-religious voters disproportionately vote more for left-wing parties in all, uh, in all countries. What is interesting to see is that the variations are substantial in these differences. And the interesting case is Argentina and Chile, because those are two countries that have strong class cleavages and still have strong, strong class cleavages. So this suggests that class cleavages have interacted, have acted as a cross-cutting cleavage with religion. And so they have like minimized these uh, religious divisions that we observe in other countries where class cleavages are not as pronounced. 
If we now go to other non-Western countries, in particular countries where there is a Muslim majority, or countries such as Israel and India, we also see that there, these religious divisions exist, but here the divisions apply to religious majority versus religious minorities and non-religious voters together. Okay, And here we are depicting the difference in the vote share to religious minorities and non-religious relative to uh, uh, the religious majority voters in the different countries uh, for, the different, uh, for the different parties. And you clearly see that there is also uh, some important, there are also some important religious divisions. And probably Juliet and Jonathan will go more in detail today on that because they will focus on some of these countries that I'm showing you here. So, so far I have shown you the typical sociocultural cleavage, which is religion, but we try to go a bit farther in the book and also study all other sociocultural cleavages, such as, for instance, the native immigration cleavage that we have in the Western world. And what our results suggest is that we can no longer say that the Western world is exceptional in that there are no sociocultural cleavages. Uh, we do see important, uh, important native immig immigrant cleavages that I will show you today. And also, I want to emphasize in this part that there are important differences in social cultural cleavages across the different countries that interact very, in a very complex manner with the structure of political inequality. So to really understand social cultural cleavages, one needs to go case by case to the different countries and regions. Otherwise, we will not be able to make any general statement about, about the way they, they interact. So let me show you very quickly the native immigrant cleavage. Here, uh, what we, I'm depicting is simply the difference between the share of voters born in non-Western countries and the share of natives voting to left-wing parties. And what you can see is, again, there is a huge difference. There are huge differences in, in this indicator in some uh, Western democracies. In some others, they are very small. How can we explain this? What we argue in the book is that the salience of immigration issues and the importance of anti-migration patterns seems to be highly correlated with this indicator. In countries such as Denmark, Switzerland, and Luxembourg, anti-migration patterns uh, parties have continuously get, get high and higher shares uh, of the vote, contrary to countries such as Iceland, Finland, and Portugal, where immigration issues are not so salient and the anti-migration parties are not important or even non-existent like in Portugal. If we look not only at the native immigration cleavage, but at the Muslim vote, so that is the difference in the share of, vote, of, of the vote to left-wing parties by Muslim relative to the rest of the population, we also see striking differences, even larger than before. And these uh, differences, again, are huge in countries where these issues, immigration issues, uh, racial issues, ethnic issues, are very salient, such as the UK, Sweden, or Denmark and way less important in countries where these issues are not so salient, such as Italy, Spain, and Spain. And you may wonder, why is it the case that we see these uh, strong cleavages? What we argue is that the reason why they might be, um, that Muslims might prefer these parties is because they feel that these parties might be less hostile to their integration in the community and in their in the country than uh, conservative or anti-migration parties that in many cases are more hostile in their speeches towards them. If we now uh, move to the non-Western world and the Western world together, we put all together, what we see is what I was saying before. It is very complex to understand social cultural activities and how they interact with income and class cleavages. And the reason is that we have some countries that we call them social inclusive parties, countries that have social inclusive parties, because the pro-poor, pro-minorities are aligned in their vote. And those are countries such as the US, because for instance, black vote in a similar way that the poor, they vote more to the Democratic Party. But we have on the other side of the spectrum, countries where the pro-poor parties are social exclusive, because they are anti-minorities. And one clear example is the case of Turkey, uh, because the AKP party was, has been very hostile to the Kurdish population. And probably, uh, again, Juliette is going to mention that more in her, in her talk. Again, you see how complex it can be to study social cultural cleavages and how they interact with class cleavage. 
Let me now move to uh, regional activities. Okay, I have four or five more minutes, so I will go a bit faster, but I hope I will be clear. Uh, let me now move to regional activities. So for regional cleavages, we have focused first on this traditional cleavage that has been studied for a long period by the political science literature, the rural urban cleavage. And what we show is, again, that this rural urban cleavage is highly persistent and uh, that it plays a particular and significant role in dominant party systems that I will show you in a bit. So let me show you first the rural urban cleavage in Western democracies. This has already been documented. We documented here with more countries and a longer time span. What we see here is that uh, basically this figure displays the difference between the share of rural areas and the share of urban areas voting for democratic, social democratic and affiliated parties. And what you can see is that throughout the whole period, even though there are some variations, rural areas tend to disproportionately support more conservative parties and urban areas tend to disproportionately uh, support more um, left wing parties. And uh, the explanations have already been given uh, in the industrial revolution uh, was really uh, uh, salient in urban areas. And, and that's why like, there is this historical heritage that urban areas tend to support more left wing uh, parties than rural areas where agriculture didn't benefit that much from the industrial uh, revolution. If we now look, take a more uh, like a broader uh, cross country perspective, and we also look at the non uh, Western world, what we see is that it is very different. Like we see that in non Western countries, pro poor parties tend to be disproportionately supported more. Uh, in the rural areas, okay? So there is an alignment of income and uh, rural, contrary to what we see in, uh, in the Western world. Again, there are some exceptions, very interesting exceptions on the left-hand side, for instance, the case of Argentina. Argentina is a country which is an exemption, and the reason is that Peronism, which is the main uh, political movement in the country, really was born in the cities. And that's why we see that at the bottom and bottom earners tend to disproportionately support more um, uh, Peronism, in, particularly in urban, in urban areas. Okay, so let me finish the regional cleavages by documenting an, another very striking uh, fact, I believe, which is the relationship between regionalistic national cleavage, nationalistic cleavages and class. And here we have four examples, the case of Belgium, Spain, Canada, and uh, Scotland, okay? And here, what is very interesting to see is that depending on the relative income of the region within the country in which they are, for instance, Flanders in Belgium is uh, richer in the whole country, Catalonia is richer than the rest of, of Spain, contrary to Quebec and Scotland, where they are the poorest region within the same country, we see that the way they vote according to income is radically different. So Quebec and Scotland argue for more redistribution, and that's why the bottom of the distribution tends to disproportionately support more of this nationalist movement, contrary to Flanders and Catalonia, where they argue for more cultural independentism and also economic independentism. And that's why they seem to be supported disproportionately more by, by the income elite. And I don't want to take more time, so let me finish with the generation, generational cleavages. In the case of generational cleavages, there has been also a lot of work being done in the political science literature. One of the things we want to highlight is that when we look at the vote in the Western world for the different new coalitions, like Green Parties, Anti-Migration, and the New Left, the picture is very striking. We already know that green parties are disproportionately supported more by the young, but something that at least was new to us is that anti-migration parties are not uh, supported by the young in the same way in all countries in, in the world. So for instance, in Switzerland, Denmark, Norway, New Zealand, and Sweden, what we see is that they are disproportionately supported more by the old, contrary to countries such as Austria, Spain, Finland, and France, where they are supported more by the young. And this, of course, might be due to the type of speech that these anti-migration parties have in order to attract the different groups of the population. So it might be the case that these young people in Spain might be attracted by this anti-migration because they, leave, they feel that they are left behind by the traditional left. Okay, contrary to countries 
uh, such as uh, Switzerland, where maybe the anti-migration anti parties do not aim to attract this part of the population, they go to the old people that maybe are like uh, angry at, for instance, immigration or other type of, of, of issues. And let me also emphasize that these generational cleavages are also very salient in one dominant party systems. And here we have the examples for the different countries where we have uh, these one dominant party systems. For instance, uh, Japan is a very clear example in the post, uh, in the second post war, post world war. Like the old were the ones uh, supporting, uh, supporting, and the, the Liberal Democratic Party, contrary to the young that were really supporting the communists that didn't want to support, to cooperate with the United States. Okay, this is an example, but we give many more examples in the book. So let me finish with the gender cleavages. This uh, figure shows the reversal of the gender cleavages in the Western world. This has already been documented before here. We documented it with more countries and, and, and uh, data points. But what is very interesting to see is that the difference between the share of women and the share of men voting for social democratic and affiliated parties has radically changed across time. In the 50s, we had a traditional gender cleavage where, where we see that women used to be more conservative relative to men, but little by little, this has uh, this tendency uh, has changed. And what we see now is that women disproportionately vote more for left-wing parties. And this might be again by the change of speech of traditional parties, including social questions that are of interest to women. For instance, abortion, divorce, and et cetera, et cetera, okay? And another explanation can be as well that we, like we, as a society, we have become less religious. Women tend to be very religious. Now women have become less religious, hence they care less about religion and they care more about the social issues that are uh, reported by left wing parties. Okay, so let me finish. Sorry for taking a few more minutes. I just, I just wanna finish with the database. Um, so we have, uh, our whole aim was to really make of this project a very collaborative project. And for that, what we did was to create a database, which is WPID.world, where we have included and we have like uh, load on the web, all the data sources that we have used. And uh, everyone that is interested in that can download the data, download the series and, and play with them just for, for learning more about it or for doing research. And there is another uh, part of the website where that we call Explorer, where you can also build your own figures when, like for instance, if you are interested in plotting uh, the income cleavage in Hungary, you can click here and really depict the income cleavage across the time space that you want uh, for Hungary, but we have it for all countries for the different socioeconomic characteristics. If you have any questions, I can, I can uh, elaborate more on that afterwards. Let me finish. Um, so basically the whole aim of this book uh, is to really uh, take a very historical and comparative perspective to study how class cleavages vary across countries and how they interact with other dimensions of political conflict. Our analysis has revealed that there are substantial variations in the politicization of inequalities that are very complex and that mirror the diversity of historical trajectories, socioeconomic structures, and lines of divisions in contemporary uh, democracies. But we want to really emphasize that, of course, our project has, because we have been very ambitious in the time coverage and the space coverage has limitations. We are relying on surveys that in some cases, yeah, they have very few coverage, they are subject to misreporting, et cetera. And our methodology is very descriptive. So we really hope that the project and this project will really inspire other researchers to elaborate more and more in depth on, on these questions that we try to tackle. Thank you very much. And sorry for the minutes of extension. Um, so thank you very much for the presentation of the book. I think it's raising a lot of questions that I'm not going to address. So you might have seen the countries coming and we keep it for the discussion. I think there are a lot of cleavages which are really interesting when we're seeing the comparative figures. Um, so I'm going to present a chapter on Algeria, Iraq and Turkey for a more limited time frame between the 1990 and 2019. This is a joint work with Lucia Aswad, Amory Guetin and Thomas Piketty. So I will proceed in three main parts. First, starting with the motivation for why including three countries of the Middle East and North Africa region within this comparative work, then turning to the data that we had at our disposal and the question we have tried to answer, and just try to give you some flavor of uh, the findings that we found and also try to 
invite you to go more in depth in the chapter and all, all the book. So regarding the Middle East and North Africa region, I think this book was asking how inequality has been reshaping the political conflict. And what the new research is showing for the Middle East is that actually it might be one of the most unequal regions in the world. So we have new data which allow us to draw the distribution of national income along the population. And if you look at the share held by the top 10% of the region, we are at level as high as the one observed in the most unequal country in the world, like Brazil, close to 65%, which is way above what is observed in the US or in Western Europe, for instance. And the second dimension for talking about how inequality is reshaping the political conflict in the Middle East and North Africa region is also related with why the Middle East has been making headlines for at least a decade now, basically the massive street protest movements that have been shaking the political agenda of the region. So we might have in mind the Arab Spring of 2011, but what is actually interesting with the three countries that we uh, studied is that none of them were really severely affected by the 2011 wave, but each of them has their own momenta of massive street movements and also political crisis taking the form of demands for fair redistribution and also anti-elite, anti-corruption and anti-system stance. So in Turkey, it was mostly in 2013, initiated by the Park Gezi protest, which started in Istanbul. And in Algeria and Iraq, it started in 2019, extended during the COVID, uh, during the pandemic, and actually led to earlier calls for elections. So we had recent elections, which are not covered in the chapter, which took place in the two countries over the last six months. Um, in terms of electoral dynamics in the region, we have the emergence of this identity-based voting. So what Clara was referring as this identity cleavage, so basically you're voting along the ethno-religious group that you are uh, trying to identify yourself with, as opposed as class-based voting. So it's a bit like a binary way of seeing uh, the vote choice, but on one side class and on the other side identity, let's say. And what is interesting is that in Iraq, after the fall of Saddam Hussein regime and the US invasion of 2003, we have a new system which is defined along sectarian lines, which is put in place. So it might recall to you the feature of the confessional system that we have in Lebanon, which is often more known. But in Iraq, we have basically a major divide within the Muslim community between Sunni and Shia, but we also have other uh, religious communities like Christian. And we also have a second divide, which is between ethnic groups, basically the majority, which is Arabs, and one quarter of the population, which is Kurds. And the sectoral system takes the form of an informal power sharing arrangement, meaning that regardless a bit of the results of the election, you will always have all communities represented in governments with the seats um, turning at each election. Because otherwise, if you are only relying on the democratic weight of the, each group, you will always have the Shia in theory winning because they are the biggest um, group in terms of democratic weight. Regarding the two other countries, what we have in terms of identity-based voting is the emergence of political Islam since the early 1990s in both contexts. And what is interesting in both Algeria and Turkey is that both regime used to be characterized by a really strong executive defined along um, a secularist definition of the state. So both in Algeria after the independence in 1962 and in Turkey with the establishment of the Republic in 1923, secularism became somewhat a way to define the country with respect to the other countries of the region, but also with respect to the Western world. And in the early 90s, it's the first time that actually we have parties which are claiming affinities with Islam that are not only managing to enter the political arena, but also who won elections. So in Algeria in 1991, the Islamic Salvation Front, victory at the general election, is actually one of the triggers of a deadly civil war which will lead to their ban eventually and then political Islam which is not going to manage to actually keep power in, in Algeria. But in Turkey, the AKP, which is still the party running today and which is governed by um, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, you have a picture here, managed not only to win the election in 2002, but also to stand alone in power for more than, for almost two decades now. Uh, it was not the first uh, political Islam party in Turkey, but it's the one who managed to say. So in terms of a research question, it's probably just this one that we're trying to address in the entire book, right? Like, how has social polarization in terms of income and education, so this inequality dynamics, is interacting with changes in political privileges observed in the Middle East and North Africa region. So here we're not trying to draw a conclusion for the region at large. We only have three case studies, which is driven by data availability. 
but we still think that our findings might hold in other settings. And we will be really happy to actually see more research flourishing across the area for comparing what we're finding. Um, in terms of data, we didn't have exposed survey in the, the region for none of the country. So we used national representative survey, which were designed with cross-country comparison. So the world value survey, the Arab barometer, and the comparative studies of electoral system, the surveys are giving us information on socio-demographic characteristics of voters, but also their choice at the last election. And this allows us to cover almost all elections for three decades in Turkey, 15 years in Iraq, and uh, 20 years in Algeria. So in terms of results now, I'm just going to give you some simplified storylines, which uh, might feel frustrating, so you're more than welcome to ask questions. And it's just a way to show you what type of question we can address with this methodology. So let's start with, uh, with Iraq, which is, I would say, the most extreme case in the entire book of sectarian divides. So here you have the vote for Shia Islamic list by region. And a region in Iraq is actually managing to capture almost perfectly, not entirely so, your ethno-religious group, because we have the three main ethno-religious groups, the Kurds, the Sunni, and the Shia, which are concentrated in well-defined areas in the country. So if you look at the yellow bar here, it's giving you the vote for Shia Islamists in the southern part of the country, where the majority of Shia is living. So basically the vote of Shia people for Shia people, if I simplify. And if you're look, looking at the blue line, is the vote of the northwest part of the country, where the majority of Sunni reside. And what this graph is showing us quite strikingly is basically if you're Shia, your likelihood to vote for a Shia Islamic list is higher than 70% all around the period, except in the election of 2018, while the support among the Sunni uh, dominated area is less than 30%. But already with this graph, we can see that something is going on in 2018, even if we are completely unfamiliar with the politics of the region. So for actually trying to understand what might be going on in this election, we are trying to introduce the income dimension, like try to find evidence for income cleavage. And here you have the vote for a secular and anti sectarian list among the poorer voters. So even if the system is sectarian, you still have some parties since the establishment of the system that have been defining themselves as either secular, refusing the divide between the two islamic group or taking explicitly anti-sectarian list and what we have actually in 2019 is emergence of a new alliance completely unprecedented in the political iraqi politics is the alliance between communists which have been historically secular and one of the most important party uh, communist party in the region actually and at the same time an alliance with um, explicitly Shia list the Sadrist. And this alliance was actually targeting the poor. And did they manage to do so? Well, if you look at our graph, it seems to be the case because if you look at the red line, it's basically telling you by how much the poorer part of the population is voting for this anti sectarian list compared to the rest of the population. And even if the gap is not that high, like we were still really close to the zero line, which is giving you. Um, the situation where there is no difference between the two groups, it still seems that we have something going on both at the start of the period and at the end of the period. So this at least is really calling for looking at how we could reintroduce socioeconomic consideration when thinking about Iraqi politics. And actually the last elections which happened in October 2021 uh, shows the, the victory of these alliances which were still running for the new elections like the communists with the Shia Sadrists. So now uh, let's turn to Turkey. So Turkey is definitely a specific case in this setting because Turkey has been a multi-party system since um, the aftermath of World War II. And what we have been wondering a lot when the AKP managed to arrive in power in 2002 was whether in this country of the Middle East we were observing a sudden transition to identity politics. So were we observing a new role played by religiosity or a higher politicization of religion in the country. And if you look at this graph, which is giving you the voting behavior of religious people with respect to non-religious people, voting either for right and Islamic parties on the green, or voting for the CHP, which is the main opposition party, which is define, defining himself as secularist, you see a pretty much a persistence of the religious cleavage over time. 
even if something is going on the, in the decades of these early decades of the 2000s, the, the cleavage seems to, seem to be pretty persistent, which basically is calling for not only looking at over dimension, but also wondering if actually the center right in Turkey was not already managing to capture the most uh, religious part of the population and then the AKP is just coming next, right? And what I'm suggesting before uh, briefly concluding is to look at the vote for the AKP back by income quantize after a second term in 2007. So if you're the poorest part of the population, you're the blue line, 20 percent poor, and basically, you're more likely to vote for the AKP by 60% uh, or more than 50% percentage point all over the period. So it's and coming back to it, something that Clara mentioned, even if we have really strong ethnic um, cleavage in Turkey with, between the majority and Turkish group and the Kurdish, at the start of the period, the Kurdish were also were voting for the AKP. It's not the case anymore in 2018, which was the grass that you had before, but at the start, the pro-poor policies of the AKB was managing to go beyond the ethnic lines. And um, this is also a call for actually digging into the distributive policies of the AKB. I have time for going through Algeria. Yeah, so quick overview of Algeria. So here you have the vote for ruling parties, the RND and the FLN, among top income voters. So you have two main parties, let's say, in Algeria. FLN, which is the historical party who has been ruling the country since the independence, defining himself as secularist, uh, arguing for a strong intervention of the state. So most people will put him in, on the left uh, in the political spectrum. And on the other side, you have the RND, which is a new technocratic party, which emerged in the 90s, which was basically calling for adopting the structural reform defended by the IMF. So in theory, the two countries are ideologically completely opposite, right? And if you look at the vote of among top income voters, it seems to make sense. So top income voters are endorsing the R&D, which is calling for liberalization, uh, et cetera, and not voting more for the FLN, which is more endorsed by the poorest part of the population. But at the end of the period, this difference is cancelling out. And why is this interesting is because in Algeria, actually, the two parties have been governing together through coalitions over the last two decades. So even if theories, they seem to have really strong ideological differences, they have been always going together in coalitions, backing each other policies, standing behind the same candidate for presidential elections. And maybe the fact that the difference in counseling out, it's just the fact that people are perceiving as a collision between the two, and then the ideological differences are cancelling out for such reason. But this is one of possible uh, interpretation, definitely open for discussion. So we were wondering if we should look at both identity-based voting and social inequality as well. The response is yes. Uh, one side of the story is not enough. It's, that it's not giving you a self-explanatory power. And the second point really specific to the area is that the Middle East and North Africa region has been understudied in comparative politics for a really long time because we were thinking that the Middle East was too specific or too different from the rest of the world so that we would not be able to incorporate it in this type of um, study. And even if you can be concerned about the regularities of elections uh, and so on, elections are still playing an important role with respect to distributive policies. So at least for this reason, it makes sense to look at them as well. And if any, we're calling for using the data that are already available, pointing the limits of them for getting uh, further data collections. Thank you. Hello, everyone. And uh, this definitely feels like the right place to be presenting this, this research, uh, which is joint with Attila Lindner, who's just sitting here in front, with Philip Novak Met in Bonn and Thomas in uh, Paris. So we'll, we're looking at uh, these very issues in three Central Eastern European countries in this period, 1990 to 2018. Uh, we'll be looking at uh, Hungary, Poland, and Czech Republic. So uh, why do we think that uh, this research, looking at these countries is interesting beyond uh, interest in the region? Well, the three countries we focus on have sort of experienced a supercharged version of what a large part of the world has been experiencing, which is a, a very rapid rate of economic growth since the transition from communism, but also growing inequalities. The fundamental question is, how did these, this transition, the political transition from communism and the uh, uh, transition of the market system shape political conflict? 
and we will be looking at it through the lens that uh, we've already seen in the previous two presentations. And there are some uh, specific phenomena that we observed. I want to see how political conflict informs us or sheds light on these. So the, the first of these is this decline of left-wing parties in all three countries. And uh, secondly, the rise of what we might call populist parties also in all three countries. So we'll be looking in this chapter of uh, Poland, Hungary and the Czech Republic. We'll be looking at harmonized survey data as we've seen in previous presentations since the first elections, which were free in the early 1990s. We will look at this decline of the left, we'll uh, just present it and then look at, uh, in this talk, just two dimensions, the income and the education dimension, and in work that goes beyond the chapter, we'll push this beyond just looking at income education and looking at ideological preferences or uh, looking into the social cultural privileges that we've seen are important in other contexts. So just a brief statement of the facts around the uh, market transition uh, that three countries experience. This is a real GDP per capita, which we've seen uh, rise quite rapidly since 1990 in all three countries. Uh, however, this rise has also been associated with a rise in inequality, and this is the top 1% income share, which has been uh, a popular measure of inequality. Uh, and here we see that uh, it's grown rather rapidly. Uh, this is uh, data from a research by uh, Philip Novakmet and Pavel Bukowski, who's just sitting there in the back. Uh, and this is uh, an indicator of how the economic growth has, in the cumulative sense, been extremely unequal. So uh, here we see that uh, the, on, the, on the bottom axis, we have percentiles of the income distribution in Poland. And we see that the top 10 percentiles are uh, very much outpacing the rest of the income distribution in terms of their cumulative uh, growth, um, cumulative income growth. So the average here is in the red line. Uh, there's a, a further aspect of this transition to market economy, which is uh, the, well, there's something which we might term a dual economy between foreign owned companies, and domestic companies. And here in blue, it, if we just focus on the dash lines, you have uh, remuneration in uh, foreign companies and in red we have domestic companies and this is in uh, thousands of euros so you see that uh, there's a significant premium for being employed in, in foreign owned companies um, so this is the the economic background and what uh, is a brief summary of the electoral trends that we observe well in all three countries the, the first elections were quite specific they they were associated with the transition from communism and broad anti-communist movements won in this election, in these elections. However, in all three countries, we do observe this rise of what might be called a traditional left-right party system. And by the mid-90s, we observed this in all three countries. But uh, in each of these countries, there is a we see an electoral collapse of the left. This happens first in Poland in 2005, uh, then in Hungary. And finally, we observe this in the Czech Republic in 2017. At the same time, we observe a rise in what has been called populist parties in uh, Hungary. We have Fidesz in 2010, uh, getting power law and justice in 2015, and Anno in 2017. So the next three graphs will just uh, show you the share of the left and the right in each of the elections since transition. Um, so this is the Czech Republic. Uh, in blue, you have the right uh, kind of categorized by kind of expert opinion on what is a left and right wing party. And we see that uh, there's a sort of left and right electoral competition that lasts all the way uh, until 2013. And then in 2017, we see a, a large decline in left wing parties and the left, vote for left wing parties. Um, in Hungary, uh, there's a similar story. We have basically alternating uh, majority votes for the left and right uh, until the very significant election 2010, which sees a very rapid drop in the votes for the left. And it's, it's persistent, and this is associated with the rise of Fidesz. And uh, in Poland, the, this is the first country to experience this. Uh, in 2005, there's a rejection of the left-wing ruling coalition, and the left hasn't recovered uh, since then. And, in terms of electoral outcomes in Poland. 
So uh, our approach to interpreting these events is informed by uh, some political science literature that uh, we thought was very useful in terms of thinking about this. Specifically, there is a suggestion put forward by Kichal uh, et al. in 1999 that the type of communism is significant in understanding the way that tran the transition evolved after 1989-1990. So Hungary and Poland had a distinctly different type of uh, communist system to the Czech Republic, uh, with the ruling Communist Party much more willing to accommodate uh, and talk to op the opposition, uh, whereas in the Czech Republic, there was a much more sort of authoritarian uh, communist system. And the break with the communist regime was much more sudden. And the suggestion is that uh, as a result, in both Hungary and Poland, the left uh, became much more willing to entertain reforms and a gradual approach and then the adoption of market, um, uh, embracing of market systems, whereas in the Czech Republic, this did not, did not happen. Uh, and the suggestion is that that has implications for the way that the, uh, specifically the redistributive dimension of competition plays out. Uh, so just to elaborate on that point, uh, in both Hungary and Poland, the left assumed a liberal pro-market stance. And this is a very interesting quote from Leszek Balcerowicz, who was the architect of much of Poland's transition to a market economy. Um, he's talking here about the left's economic policies in 2000, uh, sorry, in the late 1990s. And he says that SLD, SLD, which is the, uh, the kind of social democratic party that evolved from the uh, communist party, he said that their economic policies and goals are virtually indistinguishable from that of the Freedom Union, which was its own party. So, so this is, uh, we feel, a, an important feature of both hun the Hungarian and the Polish uh, case. So uh, I will now present the main results on income and education, uh, looking at uh, the indicators that we've seen before. So I will start with Poland, and this will be the income cleavage, which is just this difference in the probability of voting for a particular party here for individuals in the top 10% versus the bottom 90%. And here it's useful to think about maybe the first stage of transition until about the mid 2000s and then the latter stage. Um, so what is interesting here is that uh, there doesn't seem to be a very striking income cleavage with one exception, which is the Freedom Union. This was the liberal market oriented party that was very significantly uh, overrepresented among the higher income voters. Uh, the interesting fact, fact about SLD is that they didn't, they had a slight but not very strong uh, in, negative income gradient. But uh, as a sort of illustration of what non-income cleavages uh, can do to actual competition, the, uh, there was actually, the, the ruling coalition was between the, green, the party shown in green, which was uh, Avoes, so, uh, Avoes, which was that sort of evolution of the solidarity, solidarity uh, related parties and the freedom union. So there was actually no, uh, there was actually a coalition between this high income party and the party essentially evolving from the trade unions. Um, so, so this is sort of, I think, similar to the Algerian story where we have a coalition that means that in some way, the redistributive cleavage doesn't play out. And it, in fact, the Freedom Union was the, the party that dominated economic policy in this period. In the late 2000s, we, have, we see the rise of uh, law and justice and the civic platform. We have this very strong emergent uh, positive income gradient for the civic platform, which was the Liberal Party, and uh, a very strong negative gradient for law and justice. In Hungary, we do not observe a very strong income gradient uh, throughout this period, really until the most recent election in 2018, where Fidesz can be seen to be a, have a strong positive income gradient and left parties such as MSP have uh, a, a negative income gradient. And here we also see Jobbik, which is the populist party. So the, re the redistributive income cleavage doesn't seem to play a part throughout most of this transition. And this is, again, we feel 
can be explained or understood through this context of the left actually embracing market policies. Now, the Czech Republic is the interesting difference to, to both of the pre two previous cases, where after the first election, we actually observe a very strong positive income gradient for right-wing parties and a very strong negative income gradient for left-wing parties. And this persists almost all the way until the most recent election, which saw the rise of the ANOR, which had a slight positive uh, income gradient. So we think of that, thinking about the varieties of communism beforehand and the behavior of left-wing parties might actually help us explain these, these patterns. Uh, in terms of education, both Poland and uh, uh, Poland specifically reflects the income gradient. So high education, high educa highly educated individuals will tend to vote for uh, the same parties as the high income individuals. So again, the Freedom Union early on is overrepresented among high income individuals. Uh, after the first phase of transition, we have civic platform being overrepresented among highly educated voters and law and justice is overrepresented among lower educated voters. So this traditional class-based system that Clara mentioned earlier is very much a feature of uh, Polish competition where essentially education and income go together. Hungary here seems to be the exception where Fidesz, which in the most recent election has had a positive income gradient, here can be seen to be uh, having a negative education gradient. And the opposite is true of uh, MS Better, the main left wing party, which has a positive education gradient, but in the most recent election had a negative income gradient. Um, and finally, in the Czech Republic, we see similar class based voting again. Education, the education cleavage overlaps with the income cleavage. So the right wing is overrepresented among high educated voters, and the left is overrepresented among low educated voters. So, in summary, what is our interpretation of this evidence? Is that in Hungary and Poland, uh, there is no clear overall income ed or education cleavage between the left and right in the first phase of transition. And this provides the context for the decline of the left that happened subsequently. So the question that we pose is, does that electoral strategy of the left actually create a gap for a populist electoral challenge, uh, which uh, we've, we've seen in both of these countries. In the Czech Republic, we see a long running and salient income cleavage. And interestingly, the, the entry from ANO doesn't have a strong income or education gradient. So it's, it's a sort of uh, centrist entry from this uh, populist challenger. Although in most recent elections, experts have highlighted that there perhaps has been a shift in terms of Anno's electoral strategy, that it is becoming perhaps uh, more nativist, which could be correlated with maybe uh, trying to attract lower educated voters. Uh, all three countries display strong cleavages in education and uh, this very interesting difference in, in the income cleavage. So in the Czech Republic, the income cleavage is salient immediately. It's least visible in Hungary. And in Poland, it only really emerges with the rise of law and justice. And you know, if, if you know Polish politics, you will know that law and justice, when they uh, had their first electoral success, they very much uh, emphasized the redistributive policies that they pursued. OK, so I think I'll uh, finish that. Hello, everyone. Um, so, I present my work, my chapter on Israel, and I think it's quite interesting to look at Israel both within the book and more generally in the context of you know what we're talking about today, because Israel is at the same time in the Middle East, but not really a part of the Middle East, and many times where the Middle East is you know something that we think about. Uh, we forget that Israel is there, and at the same time, Israel likes to compare itself in many ways to West Europe or North America, and in general to OECD countries, uh, being part of the OECD. Uh, but at the same time, it feels a bit unique in this context. So there are many reasons for us to think about Israel as, as a kind of uh, as unique in this context as I said, and 
also, this is one of the few countries that actually has its own chapter in, in the book. So it's not really studied uh, within a group of countries like, uh, like we just saw, for example, uh, Poland, Czech Republic and Hungary. Uh, so why? So we can think of many reasons. One is that the Arab-Israeli conflict is so central in Israel politics and potentially doesn't, I mean, actually doesn't exist in at least uh, you know, Western countries. So this is one form of uniqueness. Another form is that Israel was uh, essentially, uh, it wasn't communist, but it was a socialist countries for the first and, you know, very, very socialist for about 30 years. So uh, this is also quite unique compared to other Western countries. Um, it has high levels of income inequality, but they have a very weird evolution, which we'll just see. Uh, so it's quite unique in this context. And also it has uniqueness in terms of, you know, the role of religion, the role of immigration. There is no real immigration issue in Israel because it has no real immigration policy, if, if I would say so, or, you know, a weird one to say the least. Um, so, Let's let's talk for a second about how does it look like politically. Uh, so what I did here was to bundle together right wing parties and ultra orthodox parties. We can argue that they're not the same, you know, block, but for you know at least in the last few decades, there were definitely a couple of decades. There are definitely one block, and uh, also it may not necessarily be correct to bundle together left parties with center parties and Arab parties. But, you know, for the sake of, especially not with a weird monster that is now the Israeli coalition, which is essentially a center left government with a small right wing party that is heading it. So, <laughs> um, but in the long run, what we see is um, the dominance of the left in the first 30 years of, of the existence of Israel up until the late 70s. And from then on, basically, we have a political deadlock uh, with a very few exceptions in which you know, one uh, bloc was significantly stronger than the other. And especially, as probably most of you know, in the last, uh, say, three years. Um, so with this story in mind, uh, I think what I, I, I think is, is a bit interesting in this deadlock is that you could think that it doesn't matter in a way who's in power, right? Uh, so this is another question that I'll try to, to make a point about towards the end of, of this presentation. When it comes to income inequality, we see that income inequality is quite high compared to other OECD countries, but it has this exceptional evolution over time because we have, at least we believe, this is the best data that we have, it's based on and this data is, is based on surveys, basically. Um, but it's the best information that we have that inequality has been decreasing over the past, let's say, 15 years, more or less, in Israel, uh, both in you know, pre-tax and after-tax and, uh, and transfers. So when it comes to political cleavages, then the story becomes closer to the story, I mean, despite all this kind of unique points about Israel, the story becomes more familiar and similar to the other things that we saw. So this comparison here is, you know, the simplest comparison you, you can do in a way to try and disentangle vote in among elites and the entire population. And what we see here is the vote in Tel Aviv representing, and in this sense, it's very uh, crude, but the vote in Tel Aviv compared to the vote within the entire country, uh, just the difference in percentage points. So, you know, in the first elections, people in Tel Aviv were more likely to vote to the right by about 10 percentage points and less likely to vote for the left by almost six percentage points. But you can see quite clearly how it changes over time and nowadays, uh, of course, that Tel Aviv being the most, the richest and most educated, or 
big city in Israel is much more left-leaning uh, than the general public. Again, very similar to, uh, to the kind of results that we saw before. Uh, actually, it's very similar to New York City if you do the same for New York. Um, and if we do something quite similar to, again, or more similar to the graph that we saw before, we can use now, in this case, it's mostly pre-election surveys, actually, not post-election surveys. For some reason, this is what uh, we have in Israel. We, what we are able to do is measure vote by self declared or self-defined social class. So it's it's not very easy to do it by income like in, in other countries, unfortunately. So we don't actually have uh, the income that different subjects in these surveys have. But we do have all sorts of data about them. And one of the, well, perhaps the best indicator that we decided to work with is self-defined social class. And you can see that by, you know, by this, by this variable, and again, controlling for all sorts of other variables, such as age, level of education, uh, ethnicity, religion, uh, or level of, of religiosity, uh, we can see a similar transition to what we've been observing in other Western countries, whereas what we see here in red, in red is that uh, lower class voters were more or less as likely to vote left uh, to the entire population back in the 60s and 70s, and they became so yeah, and they became less likely to vote left at you know over time. Uh, it seems to have reached to some sort of a plateau, uh, uh, which makes sense in in many other senses, which uh, I might say something about in a second. Um, I want to say something about gender. Uh, so what we have here is, uh, I think, a little bit different from what was observed in other Western countries. And at least after control, controls, we see that in Israel there is persistence in uh, this cleavage in which uh, women tend to vote left more than, uh, you know, more than men, and it has been so more or less uh, forever, or at least forever that, that we're aware of. And I think specifically in Israel, and it, been, it has been researched in, among political scientists and sociologists, the role of uh, female role models uh, play a large role. And we see in the left, historically, several uh, important female figures who headed you know, the Labour Party, and also, uh, of course, the prime minister back in the uh, back in the early seventies, and also more recently we see that. So this probably played a role in this cleavage that we see here. Uh, and Klau already showed this result for Israel. What we see is a very large and persistent difference in vote by religiosity. So what we have here is basically the difference between uh, voters who define themselves as religious and voters who define themselves as non-religious in terms of how likely they are to vote for the right, uh, for and after controls. It doesn't really matter. In this case, it's very persistent and very high. Uh, and and this, is, this takes into account also uh, Arab voter. So actually, and in right, I mean only Jewish right parties here. So this is when you restrict it to, to Jewish population, it's even higher in a way. So this is quite uh, dramatic in the Israeli elections, especially at least when you think about demographics, when the expectations are that within 30 years, uh, a much larger shell of the population, the other population in Israel is going to be ultra orthodox, at least by you know by the forecast of demographers. So I want to end with something a little bit different that we could do with the service in Israel, and this is to judge the role of reforms on political vote, and it's specifically the most, the biggest reform in Israel. Uh, in the last few decades was 
the reforms of 2003. At the time, Israel was in a, there was basically a financial crisis in Israel, a big recession, and it was inevitable to do something. Uh, the, actually, the minister that had this reform was Benjamin Netanyahu. He was then the finance minister. And he led this move, which actually turned out to be a very good move for the Israeli economy. But, okay, I'm not going to talk about it now. I'm more interested in to see how this actually affected political vote. So what these reforms included, they had many aspects. But the most important aspects, the ones that had also kind of you know, historical impact in the way they are perceived in the Israeli society, is mainly uh, welfare cuts. So mainly the reduction, the reduction in child benefits. These were enormous and very impactful, especially on families with many kids. That, and there are many of them in Israel, especially ultra orthodox families, but not only, also Arab families uh, and, and other, I mean, in general, families in Israel have many kids. So this was really a huge thing. And we, we would have thought that, you know, families with many kids would like to retaliate the government who basically put these policies forward. And what we find is no. So what we do is that we ask people in the surveys, or we looked at the surveys in the 2006 uh, elections, who did they vote for? We know who they vote for in 2003. We know at least who they say they are going to vote for in 2006. And we can actually ask ourselves, well, was a change in the party that you vote for dependent on the number of people in your household, so essentially how many kids you have, or dependent on your social class. So at least it had no, so the number of people in the household had no effect whatsoever on the probability of you to change your vote from the right, who was, okay, I forgot to say that, but the reforms were done by the right wing government led by Ariel Sharon, uh, the Likud was the biggest party by far in the 2003 elections. So the probability to change your vote had basically uh, is essentially independent on the number of kids you have, but it's not completely independent on your social class. So you could say that surprisingly, people who were hurt the most by the reforms, who were social class voters, so people who are more who were more likely to have more kids, but also less educated, uh, lower income. And uh, so they were helped more because, you know, they didn't enjoy the tax cuts. They were more likely to, uh, to receive welfare payments. So supposedly they were hurt more than other families, but they were actually less likely to retaliate or to move from the right to non-right compared to other classes. Uh, I'm, I'll skip that and, and just conclude that despite somewhat exceptional characteristics, in the long run, Israel seems to be rather similar to things that we've observed in, uh, let's say, other rich countries such as France, UK, and the US. And notably, the vote for the left was associated with lower education, lower class voters uh, back in the 60s and, and 70s, but it became mostly during the 80s uh, less likely so. Uh, and it seems like there is a strong identity component with a very weak electoral reaction to changes in economic policy and inequality. And uh, yeah, that's, that's probably, and I want actually to say, I want to say that this is probably quite universal as well. So we didn't see it in other countries, but my, my, my intuition that at least in the last 20 years, if we do something similar in other countries, we will get more or less the same result that, you know, it is an identity that plays a role more than actually how, you know, big the impact of the government on your well-being is. Uh, okay, thank you. So, uh, thank you very much. That was uh, amazing. It felt like doing a, a world tour of political dynamics <laughs> uh, and income disparities uh, 
all together. Um, so let's start the Q&A session. Uh, I want to say that for those online, please write your comments and uh, I will be happy to read your comments for you. Um, so is there any question? Who wants to start? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, really first a technical question if I may to the honour well, so, sorry, sorry, can I first sort of thank all the speakers I mean, for really interesting uh, ideas and analyses and data. Um, could you have technical points that you said, how is it that the, um, what I would call neoliberal reforms of 2003 uh, were, were followed by the Gini coefficients you demonstrated showing declining inequality? Yeah. And, 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 but before I do that, if I, just not to interrupt my flow of it, um, I wonder whether any of you have seen the. Um, um, I haven't read your book, I'm afraid, um, but um, there was a review of it in the New Left Review. I wonder whether any of you have seen it um, earlier on, number uh, number 129, uh, which um, uh, suggested that um, the, or the main critique of the review uh, was that. The book hadn't really answered the, the main question of why uh, in the democracies um, the uh, social, at a time when social inequality was increasing, um, the, uh, the left was declining. Um, what, what, uh, I wondered how you'd respond to that. Um, but I, I sort of get the, get the answer really from listening, especially to Clara, when you were saying that you were uh, trying to explain why these new identity cleavages had emerged. But then late in the same, at the same time, you also said that your objective was mainly descriptive to show what, your, what was happening. And could it be that perhaps I made the main contribution of your book, rather than trying to explain the um, uh, the, the, the connections between the identity and other cleavages um, and uh, changes in inequality um, is that you've got, done this marvellous database which allows then other people, um, political scientists perhaps who have specialists, specialism in particular areas, to go to use your data and try and make that explanation. Thank you very much. Yeah, the answer is is quick. It's quite simple. Um, sorry. So yeah, basically, after the reforms, many people who didn't work started working because they had no choice, and this had this impact, huge impact, on oh, basically on inequality, which led to decreasing inequality over time. So that's the, the short answer. At least this is the perceived act. I, I should say this is the perceived explanation. Um, and yeah, we don't have better data or explanations to it. This is what I would say. Thank you very much for your questions. Um, indeed, uh, I agree that like we, we have been very clear in the introduction and the conclusion of the book that the main aim of the book is to really put on the table this database and these what we think interesting facts mm -hmm. to start uh, thinking more about the interactions between political cleavages and social inequalities. In the book, we give some suggestions of potential stories, but by no means we aim to claim that this is that, of course, what we are doing is causal. So all these um, suggestions are subject to discussion and also to further exploration. But regarding the point of why is it that uh, we have seen that like at the, at the same time we have, we have seen an increase in inequalities in most world regions and a decline in the left. I mean, one of the things we argue is that this might be explained by the fact that left-wing parties or what we tend to call traditional left-wing parties have not really uh, implemented the policies that were benefiting the poor. And this has, of course, uh, like shifted these poor individuals from there, away from there. And now, now what, what we see, for instance, in the Western world I've shown you, is that this rise of anti-migration parties is really like is really behind, like the ones that are really behind are the poor. We see that um, in many, like in Switzerland, we see that in, in, in France, in Spain, uh, et cetera, et cetera. 
Uh, and then the other thing that I think it's important is to understand why why the decline, like why the increase in inequality has not come to an increase with the left is also because I think, as I have shown you before, we have seen that there has been a complete political reshuffling of the spectrum of political parties. And now, like, it's not only economic matters what matter. We see that identity and other sociocultural issues matter. And so people might no longer be voting along welfare policies, but they might also be voting along other issues such as the environment, immigration, etc. So this might explain, I think, these are the two pot potential explanations why we don't see that. But again, the main contribution is to really put this data and we hope that more, like, more researchers from all disciplines, sociologists, political scientists, economists, uh, will contribute to, to, to better explain what we do. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, Paul? Thank you. Um, uh, yes, it's fascinating. Uh, and uh, one of the things that struck me was you're leaning very heavily on this uh, division between left-wing parties and right-wing parties. So I wonder if you could say a bit more about how you decided which parties were left and which were right. And um, uh, it jumped out to me the case of Poland, where, as, as you were telling us, the, the supposedly left-wing party implemented austerity from the early 2000s, and then the supposedly right-wing party trumpeted its progressive redistributive policies at a certain point. Um, and uh, that seems to me to be troubling, uh, I mean, from the point of view of the analysis. Uh, this follows directly from what Tyler was saying, but maybe uh, voters are continuing to vote for what they, or at least a large chunk of voters, are continuing to vote for what they perceive as left wing policies that favor for them. It's just that, you know, our labels of which the parties are, um, are, are missing that. And of course, the other policies the parties as, uh, uh, are, are kind of the most, if you like, change. So, so the economically left wing party now might be the one that's extremely anti immigrant, whereas the economically left wing party before was the one that had, uh, wasn't like that. Um, I can say yeah, you can a little bit that. about the, uh, the way we categorize the left right was uh, based on, uh, I believe it was a political scientist. Uh, survey and they scored each of these parties <laughs> you know so um, we kind of we didn't want to go into a lot of deep uh, sort of theoretical justification we sort of deferred that decision on what parties left and right to to kind of you know the experts but um you're you're right that looking at the left and right in terms of understanding central eastern europe the three countries we're looking at uh, there's not that much to be gained by looking at the left-right distinction. You, you actually, there are multiple dimensions of competition, one of which is income uh, or a re, sort of a redistributive dimension. And, and yeah, it, the left and right distinction doesn't really help you understand how that plays out with the right and Poland becoming the redistributive you know, the party. Uh, and, and the redistributive issue is not really playing much of a part in, in Hungary for a very long period, but I like to, you know, uh, confirm that. <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Thanks, Paul. I think it's a very pertinent question. And of course, we also struggle ourselves when we had to do this categorization, because in some countries, it's very straightforward. And when you have two parties, it's very easy. But when you have like multi-party systems, what, what we observe in most countries now in the world, it's very hard. At the same time, because we want, we were, we had this ambitious project where we wanted to cover so many countries for so many periods, we had to make some assumptions to be able to make some comparative uh, statics. And uh, so the, the way we we, we, th we we did it and we thought about it is that we were going to pull parties into the most consistent coalitions according to what they were really like then governing. So for instance, like, I don't know, like if like the Greens were governing together with the left and uh, like the traditional left, the social parties and the social democratic parties were putting them together. If the right was in coalition or at least in, uh, similarly in line with the anti-migration party, we were putting them together. Again, there are some cases where this is a bit troubling. For instance, with liberal parties, sometimes it's very hard, um, but and that's the best we could do for our analysis. And I'm pretty sure that if we were, we were, we were have to do only a case study for a particular country, we would have done something much more fun. In the Western world, uh, we have also decomposed in the analysis 
the different types of parties so that we can also see what happens to only liberal, Christian Democrats, communists, green, anti-migration. In the non-Western world, what we did, because we don't have this type of multi-party systems, what we did, we, we really looked at who were the coalitions that were the pro-poor coalitions, and we compared the pro-poor coalitions with the non-poor. It's a very simplified uh, case. For instance, I can give you an example. In Peru, uh, which is the, one of the, of, the, of the countries I study in death, there is competition between the, the pro-poor coalition and basically between the right or the, like the conservative parties and the progressive parties to attract the poor. So it was impossible to have like a pro-poor coalition. So what we did was basically we split them into two and we analyzed the two separately. So in, depending on the country, we also have made some different assumptions, but in general, that's the basic uh, methodology that we have followed that is simple, but at least help us to make some uh, cross-country comparisons, but thanks. Just, sure. yeah. Just one more thing about Poland. I'm some of the surveys there was also opinion mm. about the other whether you consider the party left right and those uh, at some point you saw the things with those but then it is they want to but you get very similar pictures uh, for most of the so the people. voters think, asking the voters themselves yeah, so it's, it's not they... just the political scientists but it seems to be the voters also consider those left parties even though they do it now with their own Policy. So, so that's okay. Julia, would you like to jump in or? Um, yeah, sure. I was thinking we all also had the same for Turkey, for instance, because it was actually a question of how we would categorize the AKP in Turkey. Like, is it a right wing, a, a left wing party? Is it a completely new player? But then, if you're looking at how people are self positioning themselves, you have a higher correlation of defining yourself as right wing and voting for the AKP. Even if the AKP seems to have this really pro poor distributive policy. Because at the same time, they have this pro poor alleviating poverty policies, but they're also um, really pro liberalization, opening to the market, and so on. So I think the question is more whether this divide makes sense in a given context or not. Like in the Iraqi system, it was almost impossible to come with this divide just because you have no literature or really limited literature which will tell you that this specific party we can be located in the right or left. So that's the reason why we completely uh, avoid this like, question in the Iraqi case. Uh, yeah, I think uh, in Israel, I would only say that this is clear that, you know, the, that the main party that represents the right in Israel used to be representative of people who were perceived as lower class in their own eyes back in the days where the Socialist Party was in power. So in the 50s and 60s, the right-wing party was the party that was most celebrated in the, in the worst parts of the country. Not because of their policies, but just because they hated the system in a way. And this kind of remained the situation until this day, regardless of whoever had doing the same, which policy. And this is kind of the identity I was talking about. You know, you, you see the Likud, you see the right wing as the party that represents you because you don't belong to the other group. You don't care if, if they, you know, if they cut your wealth in a way. And uh, I think this is kind of, you know, I'm a little bit exaggerating, but this is an account to the picture that we, we are seeing in the last few decades in Israel. Okay, uh, yes, Paul. So uh, first of all, thank you so much for this uh, amazing book and presentation. So I, I, I think I have a little bit of follow up on the first question. So, I mean, I found it particularly striking that you observe growing income inequality across many countries. So we'd expect that this kind of income feature become more and more silent. And so, uh, so, yeah, so you know, people will start voting more of, along the kind of income traditions. And so, uh, so in this context, so, I think it's a question to, to Clara. To what extent, like, I kind of the claim that the income privilege is becoming less important instead of educational privilege becomes the, the prominent one? To what extent this is this experience of uh, the Western countries, or to what extent we can also generalize it to other, uh, let's say, continents? And we could see in the case of Poland that actually there is an important income kind of component after 2007. Um, yeah, so, and 
kind of related to this question, like, do we actually see some relationship between uh, the level of income inequality, of the rise of income inequality, and the changes in this education, whether this is coming from, from income to education or the other way around? Uh, maybe we can collect some more questions. Uh, Elias, you were. Oh, sorry. Yeah, both of you. Um, first of all, congratulations for all the work that was done in the book. Um, I have a question about uh, political representation, especially in the context of the democratic system, and uh, just provide some more insight. There has been the case, uh, for example, in Europe, where a larger part, a larger segment of society sees itself as either isolated or not represented by existing political coalitions. And that is typically reported at, at, until at least the last uh, 10 years to people who abstain from voting. Uh, of course, that is tied to the creation of smaller, post left, post right uh, political formulations that may be short lived, that may be long lived, etc. So I was wondering how your findings or how the work in that book could provide some insight into that. Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you as well for uh, this research. I wanted to ask if the other kind of uh, more recent neoconservative trends uh, emerge in, in this study. I'm particularly interested in those that uh, are part, uh, against uh, or like have, did, have uh, proposals against the recognition of sexual and reproductive rights uh, for uh, women and for their uh, rights of lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people that have been like relatively successful in some Latin America and Central and Eastern European countries. I wanted to ask you if these kind of trends emerged in any of the, your analysis, and if so, if you could elaborate uh, on the uh, relationship that these uh, trends could have with uh, economic inequalities. Maybe Clara, you can start. Okay, um, so I will go from the first question of Fabian. Um, why is it the case again? Uh, your question again is what, like, why is it again that increasing inequality has not come together with an increasing share uh, for left wing parties? And whether we can relate this to non Western countries? Again, um, it's the, the book, our aim is not really to explain this because it would require really focusing on a few regions and do a much, a much more detailed analysis. And what we, are, what we argue is that, uh, like, these this different trajectories might be explained by the, by the fact that left-wing parties have changed or have like moved away from these like more socioeconomic policies to care about questions that are not really aiming that much at reducing inequality. And in a companion paper that I have like with, together with Amori and Thomas, uh, what we do is like we, do, we use data from the political, like from the manifesto project and we try to correlate these income and education cleavages with the salience of social economic issues, like, sorry, social cultural issues and not economic issues. And what we see is that uh, there is a positive, like, uh, like there's an increasing correlation in, social, in the uh, social cultural issues reported by left wing parties and this education, reversal of the education and income cleavages. So these points in the direction that it's no longer so important for like the class or the economic the economic policies for the people and rather individuals are trying to care more are starting to care more about other issues as i explained before such as environment and immigration LG, L, L, I, I guess we said like lgtbi uh, issues etc so i think we are moving now to a world where we it's not long it's no longer economics it's uh, more than economics uh, uh, and and People, like, people are voting along these lines more and more. In the non-Western world, we see that in some cases, but it's much more complex because the silence of other, of other cleavages is more pre prominent, like for instance, religion or even class. So for instance, we have good examples in Latin America where class cleavages are still very important, such as the case of Argentina, uh, where it seems that still the heritage of Peronism is really uh, making this class cleavage persistent and social cultural cleavages not, do not seem to be as pronounced. But in general, um, in the Western world, we do see this, this transformation and this shift from class a class based system to a multi system. Partly, we suggest that it's due to this emergence of new social cultural uh, cleavages. Um, the second question is about abstention. 
Um, so that's a very good point, actually. We would have loved to also study abstention because we do agree. I mean, I completely agree, and we agree that uh, abstention might have played a role in explaining the dynamics. Unfortunately, the post electoral service that we use uh, do not have a very good coverage of abstention, and, and, and they are not. In general, they are very poor to really um, to measure abstention because they are not representative across socioeconomic characteristics. So in this uh, work, we have like abstract from abstention, but we comment on that in the book and, and we argue that, of course, it would be very important to understand, to better understand abstention because it would allow us to, it would allow us to explain better this emergence of multi-elite party systems because I totally agree that part of this a reversal of the education cleavage might be not only due to the fact that the bottom are shifting to anti-migration patterns, parties, but it might also be because they are, have stopped voting for, for the left. So this is something that unfortunately we cannot look at, but it might certainly be the case and it would be interesting to, to study it further. And then the last question uh, on LGTBI issues and Latin America. And Latin America is a very complex region. Uh, we have two chapters in the book, and we see that uh, depending on the country and the context, the salience of the different cleavages is very different. Uh, it seems the case uh, that, for instance, in Costa Rica and, and Mexico, we see that they are closer to what we see in the Western world, where we see that there is like a, an increasing education cleavage, suggesting that these type of issues that you're mentioning um, are starting to be more salient and, and they are taken into account by the high educated, usually young elite. Uh, but again, these type of issues do not seem to be so salient, at least when it comes to the vote, in the case of uh, Argentina, for instance, where we see that the voting uh, that the voting has not changed that much in terms of the structure according to education and income between the 90s and, and the 2010s. Um, but it will be interesting again, yeah, to further explore these comparisons uh, and see whether we can find more similarities uh, with the West and the and the non-Western world. Thanks. So I I'm going to try and kind of respond to Pavel's question by thinking through one of the, two of the countries we've, we've looked at. So um, you know you might think that the evolution of incomes, and you'll know this better than I do, but the uh, the three countries are fairly comparable in terms of the rise in inequality. You know, there are differences between them, but, you know, they're more similar than, say, the Baltics are than they are. The, the interesting thing about how it is income and a salient cleavage, it, you know, what are the, are the cross-cutting cleavages? And I think that the interesting thing about Central Eastern Europe is that the communist communism or post-communist versus uh, opposition opposition activist cleavage is extremely important in a lot of these countries. So in Poland, I think you very clearly see that that is the dominant cleavage and you have people disagreeing on economic policy working together because they cannot work with the post-communists because that is too much of a, you know, the cleavage cuts across that divide. Uh, I think the Czech Republic is interesting because you have essentially an unreformed uh, communist party that in some way you can see it you know, creates space for a non-communist left-wing social democratic party to emerge, which is something that doesn't happen in, uh, in, in Poland or Hungary. So you have, uh, you, you basically have a, a party that is not tainted by the communist kind of brush that is competing on the, on the redistributive dimension. So I think that's, that's a really interesting kind of feature of comparing those two countries. You have this difference in how the left wing part, the left wing party strategy, and I, uh, I suspect that it basically means that in, in the Czech Republic, it meant that the, the communist versus a opposition cleavage was not playing such an important part, and there you see a bigger, a more important redistributive cleavage uh, earlier on. So that, that's just my hypothesis. Um, on the uh, on the abstentions, I mean, we've looked at abstentions, and actually, it's very interesting that there is a strong income gradient in abstentions. Um, and in fact, I think it, it seems like law and justice post 2015 actually uh, it, it actually reduces abstentions to lower income uh, in the lowest uh, part of the income distribution. So I think it's it's really interesting. But yeah, we we kind of didn't really go into it in a lot of detail. You want to quickly jump in? Or... Um... And just thinking for abstention is definitely a key aspect for the Middle East 
and as, at least for Iraq and Algeria, because in Algeria, for instance, for the parliamentary elections, you have a really, really low turnout. But at the same time, it's still one interesting to know who is actually voting. And at the same time, um, in this type of survey we have, we can have higher fake turnout somehow, because more people will express affiliation with a party, even if they actually do not turn out at the end. So you're capturing something else somehow. But like, for instance, for Iraq, um, the last election for the first time, the turnout really, really completely fell. Um, I'm talking about the last election, which happened a few months ago. And maybe what we have been trying to show with our data was like, do we have a cleavage in terms of abstention? Like, do we observe that it's only the poorest not voting or is it more only one of the ethno-religious group? And actually, we do not find any cleavage, like a clear cleavage for abstention, which will suggest that we have cross-sectarian and cross-class uh, dynamic here. So definitely calling for further research. I also want to say a word about abstention, if we have... Okay, so but since there is a question just for you from Zoom, I will just okay. like, wait a second. So I think we have only five minutes left. So there's going to be one question from Daniele uh, from Zoom. And we can collect one more question, if there is any. Yes, one? Now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now so we will... That question was a practical one. Right. Would, you, would you say that the data is now available? Right. Thank you. And actually, Daniel is asking uh, why inequality in Israel has grown or remained high uh, during the long period of dominance of the left. So I would suggest you, you can start. Uh, okay. So I answer the the abstention question. First, because it's actually a really interesting case in Israel. So the group that, the two groups that are the furthest away from one another in terms of turnout is the ultra orthodox, which vote. So turnout rates among ultra orthodox is the highest among any group in Israel, and this is the poorest group in the country at the same time. Whereas Arabs, which is also let's say the second poorest group in the country they have very low turnout rates. So this is quite interesting. If we would do it by income, we wouldn't see probably a, a strong cleavage, but obviously something is, is quite strong there. And interestingly, I think that higher turnout rates among the Arab population can actually break the deadlock that I was mentioning uh, in, in my talk, because obviously uh, the Arab population is underrepresented in the parliament simply, uh, not simply, because it's not the only reason. Also, many Arabs actually vote for Jewish uh, parties. I wouldn't say Jewish, but Jewish-led parties rather than Arab-led parties, uh, but also because they have very low turnout rates. So this is uh, about abstention in Israel, which is quite an important thing. Uh, this, the question from Zoom, uh, it's actually not entirely true. The graph that I showed was showing an increase in inequality from maybe the late 70s or early 80s. We don't have the data actually about the period that precedes that, unfortunately. So the observation that inequality went up during uh, the dominance of the, uh, of the Labour Party and its predecessors uh, is not accurate. I mean, we don't know. Probably it's not the case. Actually. We don't think about it. Uh, maybe yes, can... regarding the data, thanks for the question. Juan. Um, so we have made, a, basically what we did, which was the collective effort and really what the main part of the job that we did before to writing the book is that we cleaned all surveys and make them consistent across time and across countries. So basically what, what is available is already the cleaned version, harmonized version of the survey with the different socioeconomic variables that we look at. So all the microfiles are available for you to download. What is not available is the raw survey data. So it's only the database with the clean version and harmonized version for the different countries. And we have a code book that you can look at. Everything is, is and there is even a note about the explanation, how we do it, everything to make it as transparent as possible. But if, if anyone has questions, we are happy to, to answer them through email or whatever. 
Well, uh, on this note, uh, since it's seven o'clock, um, please join me in saying thank you very much to all the speakers today.